there you can hear me. I'm glad everybody made it. It's kind of a grim gray day. Uh, before we get into our lesson today, I wanted to lift up some important missions information. Our missionaries of this week are Chris and Lucinda Radabaugh. You can see their picture on the back. My goodness, they've been here forever. Mark and I were just talking. Uh, we came in the same year in 93. They, they were here when we got here and did four years of mission work for the deaf in Kenya. And then uh, since then, since 1995 in South Africa, and you talk about faithful. Well, when you're faithful, it gets the devil's attention. And Mark just told me, and I read in this letter here, that they've had several really dramatic spiritual warfare type attacks on their ministry. And their ministry has been there for years. One thing is a witch doctor has targeted their ministry and is doing animal sacrifices on their property and calling on the name of their gods or their little demon gods. The local police said, you need to build a fence. You know, you need to build, a, and we've sent them $2,500 to build a fence. We're going to try to wait. I'm sure God's going to take care of them. You know, set the phasers on kill. <laughs> I'm afraid if you're trying to stop the work of God with, a, with animal sacrifices and things. And the other is uh, they've had just at the same time, the timing of the devil, unfortunately, is perfect to have some men that have been faithful there that are drifting and they've had to put them out of the ministry, which breaks your heart at any time, but especially when you're going through uh, something like this. So this is a very urgent need uh, that God would show himself strong and the devil would be lit up for uh, weakness and in misdirection, and also that they will replace or restore those men. I certainly hope they can, but it sounded like they might need to be replaced. We'll go to uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 3 through 8. For, for the second time, this is our last lesson on, on the con life under control. I thought we were through after six lessons, and after we did the Christmas lessons, we found two more. Dr. Olford's working away. Uh, next week, we start our stewardship lessons, which are uh, Dr. David Jeremiah series. He's a very good Bible preacher. But the uh, Life Under Control series has been about thoughts, it's been about intents, it's been about our heart. Uh, today it's kind of a summary, the control of our sexuality. And what this is, it's going to show how not being under control in our mind, our emotions, our will, and the control of our body, the temple, uh, can lead to disasters in an individual, in a marriage, in a home, in a church, in a nation. But really everything comes down to individuals. Nations don't repent. Nations are not saved. We don't need to worry too much about the culture. It's never going to be in our favor. But what we do need to worry about is the effects of the wrong outlook on marriage, on courtship, on family, uh, growing your family up, and seeing how the Bible talks about this very accurately and gives us two or three diagnostic clues as to some problems we're seeing, and then also two or three things we can do to put our uh, body, soul, and spirit back on track, and that would include our maleness, our femaleness, our marriage life, our ch child life, our family life. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20 says, What know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which is of God, your uh, not your own, you're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God with your body and spirit, which are God. So this is all together. We think of a sexuality as somebody physically doing something wrong, and it will lead to that. But this all starts uh, with temple maintenance and temple intercession, and that's what's going on here. Uh, and we're going to do a short, short review today, maybe two points on the desecration of the sex life when you are not walking with God in your marriage or your family or your home or your church. And then also, thank goodness, we'll have uh, a positive follow-up of the consecration of the sex life, giving that part of our life to children and to home and to family and to bringing up a godly generation uh, into, into our nation, into our, into our community. Uh, if you want to learn about disasters in physical life, I guess the number one person that would know about these would probably Mark. <laughs> Pastors have to deal with terrible things that they hear about, and a lot of them lead to loss of control in your physical life. The second person would be me. Uh, people come and they talk, and about 39 seconds into the interview, they say, well, the real, re real reason I'm here, which my nurse knew the real reason they were there, because they said, reason for a visit, personal need to talk to a doctor. I know exactly what that means, and it's not good. Uh, that's the sort of thing that comes up in the life of a small community. 
I remember when I first was here, the very first year I was here, I was 27 years old, and a man came in and he had been over to Europe and had gone to Amsterdam or some place where I knew prostitution was legal and he was just literally sweat coming off his face and apparently he'd gotten into a big mess and he said, you need to check me out completely, you need to have it done by this afternoon. He didn't want to go home to his wife with any possibility of some sort of disease or something like that. His face was as white as a ghost. I don't remember exactly how it turned out, doesn't sound like it turned out very good but it just shows you the ripples that can be caused when our body is not dedicated and put aside as the temple of God to live out the life of God in a marriage, a home, a family, a church. Uh, same sort of thing uh, with, with uh, God's plans on these. They're very simple. A lot of these simple things, you may not have heard this. Have you heard of the big rocks theory? Uh, Adrian Rogers used to say, uh, we have some decisions to make. My wife and I are going to have a big rocks. Dis dis someone said, what does that mean? He said, well, think of a plexiglass cylinder. He said, and you're going to fill it all the way up. How can you get the most into your life? He said, the first thing you can do is put some big rocks in there. And he mentioned some big rocks. He says, for example, I don't have to worry about committing adultery with my wife because I'm not going to do that. Now, most people that say that, I'm not sure. Dr. Roger said that, he had worked through that, and he'd come to that decision. And he said, there's not that many more rooms in here, but we'll try to reduce uh, temptation, we'll try to reduce exposure to all sorts of illness and evil. He said, I'm going to try to act out and put into my daily life and my schedule some of God's big rock principles. One of God's big rock principles is for sexuality. Here's his plan. One man, one woman, one life. Okay, if someone dies, you can certainly get remarried in, in biblical if as long as you meet the criteria. But that, that takes out men and men and men and women and all sorts of things that we wouldn't believe in and the Bible wouldn't believe in. And they also, the next thing is the marriage bed is undefiled. That's wonderful. That has all sorts of positive implications. God's uh, gift of sex, it's absolutely wonderful as long as it's in that boundary. Uh, another one would be, will be fruitful and multiply and procreate and fill the earth. Now that's exciting now that we're grandparents and we don't have to have the babies anymore. I want them to have all sorts of babies. I want every time I call, I'd be glad if they had another one because we love that. And that shows you the joy of properly applied and introduced sexuality, which is a gift from God and can lead to more grandbabies like my beautiful grandbabies and your grandbabies too. <laughs> the uh, idea there is there is one right way it knocks out all sorts of problems if you walk in that way. Now, but here's the problem, and we're going to go through this today. The problem is, number one, recognizing and understanding what's right and what's wrong in this. And we're grown-ups in here, and hopefully we've got a good grip on that. Number two is deciding in your heart that that's how you're going to live and that's what you're going to do, and meaning it. Uh, not, not going off to the right hand or the left. But then you think, well, there, that's got it. I've put my foot down. Well, we're, we're not that impressed with you, and you're not that impressed with me. We need power to put this on, and we've got to have God's indwelling power by the filling of the Holy Spirit. Or you can make any resolution you want. Mark said he didn't believe in resolutions. I don't believe in resolutions either because you can't keep them. The heart of man is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked. Who can know it? It just won't stay down here on earth. We're going to do our best, and we're going to encourage each other. But we're not going to act like by making a resolution, that's the end of it. That's a joke. We're still in the flesh. We're a Roman 7 bunch, if there ever was any at all. So let's go ahead and go to our text today. And Paul is writing to the Thessalonians, and he's making some points about people that know God and people that are pagans that don't know God and how there should be a sharp, salty difference. The first thing we see, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3 through eight says, for this is the will of God. Now we've been taught here, well, that should perk you up. This is a sentence about the will of God. Even your sanctification, you're being set apart for the purpose of holiness, that you should abstain from fornication. Fornication is an umbrella term for sexual sin. You can put any of the things that you read about and hear about on the evening news. You can tuck them all in there and you can make further distinctions later, but that's just all manner of wickedness. Uh, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel. Now, that's that verse I just gave you, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20, that our vessel and our temple is our house, and we are to possess it because the, God's Holy Spirit is to inform our human spirit. 
our human spirit is to inform and direct our human soul. And the operations of the mind and the intents of the heart are to direct our bodies. And we head out into the world. We launch out into the world under that chain of authority. That's the idea, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel, how? In sanctification, that's different from everybody else. The world doesn't understand. They think you're a bunch of flunkies. Welcome to the club. Uh, and, and, and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence. Concupiscence is a hard word to deal with. So I'm going to say lust right here. Not in the lust, even as the Gentiles which know not God. Well, where do we get most of our Gentile information? It's from the 8,000 channels that Spectrum puts on my cable box which I like about, I watched a Mecham auto auctions yesterday and I checked my balance twice. I don't have enough money to buy those cars, but I like to watch them. Most of the channels are harmless. Not all of them. I don't know why. Uh, not, the, the, the lust that is uh, worrisome and that is a mark of the pagan society and the one that you are reminded not to base your life decisions on is that of the Gentiles, which what? Know not God. Capital G God, they don't know the one true God of heaven who's revealed himself through creation and conscience and that has come into our life and directs us lovingly and directly. That no man, here's, here's the things that happen when you are acting like a Gentile that knows not God, might go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter because that the Lord is the avenger of all such as we have forewarned you and testified. He is saying, be not deceived, God is not mocked, whatsoever man soweth that shall he also reap. That applies to sexual sin. Boy, we know that. It applies to all sorts of sin of our body, soul, and spirit, but particularly of the body. I, I was an ER doctor for the first four and a half years that I was here, and I treated a whole bunch of disastrous sexual sin. I don't see as many now. It's just small town, but people do sneak off and get in trouble just like anything else, like you'd expect. And they come in, and we do our best, but that's going to keep happening because be not deceived. Every kick has a kickback. You try to eat your cake and have it too, you'll have a crummy tomorrow. And all sorts of little ideas here that are not good. For God, again, has not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. He, therefore, that despiseth, that is, uh, the idea that we should follow God's truth, uh, despiseth not man, but God who hath also given unto us his Holy Spirit. Here's another reason why we don't have to act like pagans even after we are saved, uh, because we have an advantage that the third person of the Trinity lives in us. And the, hopefully the word of God is dwelling in us as we're learning it and teaching it uh, to ourselves. And that Holy Spirit plays that word of God like a piano. He brings up the notes. He brings up the ideas. You have an advantage. It doesn't make you saved or keep you saved. And if you commit a sexual sin and you're a Christian, you don't lose yourself. But it, I'm talking about living for Christ in a wicked world, not looking like pagans, not giving Mark or me. I do some funerals occasionally. Uh, an opportunity to say, I wonder where this guy was from. I wonder what's happened to him. You don't want to live so close to the world that we can't tell. But not man, but God, who hath also given unto us his Holy Spirit. Let's see, that is verse 8. That's all. Now look at the warning of the apostle here. And here's a little bit of Christian history. This is very interesting. If we don't watch out and we get over in those channels that we believe in politically, we'll start thinking, that traditional family values will bring America back to its prominence in the world. Traditional family values are a lot better than whatever the wackos on both coasts are doing now, but they're not enough to establish a nation or a people or a God. They, we, we need biblical family values or traditional biblical family values. That's where the power would be, and that's a very small area. But we don't want to be like the Gentiles. Well, that brings in history. Uh, Paul, in several places, uh, when these words were written, the Roman and the Greek world were absolutely awash in moral and spiritual and sexual laxity. We've studied about in Corinth, there was a temple that had 3,000 priestesses that really were pre temple prostitutes. They, they brought you to a, a ceremony where through ecstasy you had the gods enter you and you entered the gods, and it was all demon warfare, and these were really temple prostitutes, and this was normal. If there had been a, a religion channel of that day, they would have had their own show. 
You say, surely not. Surely so. And then not only in Corinth, but in Thessalonica, uh, this was a large seaport. Military is not, not, does not do very well with, uh, with that because these are young men in that day and they had no restraint. And the, the, it says the newly formed church was relentlessly exposed to the penetrating immorality of a large seaport. And that's exactly right. Paul exhorts his reader to remember that prostitution of sex is the result of a passion and desire of an unregenerate life. He's saying that when we were lost, uh, I don't know if you came to Christ as a child or a teenager or a young adult, all of those are difficult times. Uh, old, that's difficult because you're lonely. Every, there's traps laid in every part of uh, the human condition, but lost people in whatever phase of that go completely off the rails. You and I did. I didn't, wasn't saved till I was 24, so I was pretty tangled up too, uh, regarding God's plans for sexuality. There are three points here. I put them down on your handout that Paul makes, and Dr. Olford uses some big words, so I'm going to try to follow these, but they're, they're, they're very close together. Number one, the world has no other recourse. The whole approach of the lost world entering our home, unfortunately, by radio and television, is uh, in three categories. Number one, sexual perverseness. Look in verse six, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother. Man born in sin, shapen in inequity, uh, still breaks the rules that he has in his own heart and commits uh, sexual sin. You say, well, those pagans don't have the Holy Spirit, but you know every pagan society had rules and laws, and that's what uh, Paul was arguing about in Romans chapter two, is that even people that don't have the word of God have the conscience. Francis Schaeffer said, uh, someone said, Dr. Schaefer, is it fair that someone who never heard uh, the gospel uh, goes to hell? How could he be counted a sinner? And he talked about this, the second great witness that we, we rebel against, the re witness of conscience. He says, if you could take a tape recorder, Dr. Uh, Schaefer was in the 70s, he said, if you could take a tape recorder and put it around an, a, a rope around your neck, and we could listen to everything you said for a few decades and everything that you said as a pagan. Well, I may not be a Christian, but I'll tell you what, that's wrong right there. That is absolutely wrong. And applied that standard that you had brought up, would you keep it or fail it? Your own standards you would break, and you would know that you are a lawbreaker, not a law keeper. And that's the idea here. These people, uh, every civilization, Every pagan knows that there are guards and laws and rules about particularly uh, sexual relationships, about marriage, about home, about family, about uh, who can do this and that's okay or who can't, cannot do this. Civilized or uncivilized, there are always people that are going to take advantage of that by stirring up desires that cannot be legitimately fulfilled. That is just uh, dangerous and evil, civilized or uncivilized. This is typical of our modern uh, rebellious age, going too far and hitting the wire and keeping on going emotionally, physically, men, women, boys, girls. Dr. Olford says, violate these boundaries which God hath ordained for the safety and purity of the human race. So you're unsafe now and you're also impure. Number one is sexual perverseness, which means you're going across the wires that you yourself set. Number two, sexual oppressiveness. You, this is something to think about. It talks about going on and oppressing. This is oppressing somebody weaker than you. This is taking advantage of people. This is like human trafficking, which we have even in our area, even in Marstown, I've talked to several, you've probably talked to them for the law officers. I wouldn't think that that would be in Marstown, Tennessee, but it is. Little people that need help and direction, and there's no hotter place in hell than people that would lead them astray, but they are being oppressed because somebody is older, stronger, they're in a bad situation, they're desperate for attention. Young girls you talk to, they get tangled up in things like that. They, they don't have any money, they don't have, you could give them a ring and they would follow you to the ends of the earth because nobody's ever done anything for them. And then they are oppressed by these stronger people. Number three, not only sexual perverseness, which you go off the rails not only from God's word, but from the, this, the uh, the uh, inclinations of the day, and sexual oppressiveness, when you're overreaching and oppressing somebody weaker than you, 
brutally and, and in with ill intent. Then sexual excessiveness. Uh, this is in verse 6, that no man go beyond and defraud. Going beyond and really overreaching. It means oppressing and overreaching. When you have something that hits a family, say someone's unfaithful and a child just comes out of that, that child has a very hard time. It's got a very hard start in their life. The person that is sinned against, the other spouse, has a very hard time ever getting over that. They will, they're going to be affected for not only years, perhaps decades, perhaps generations. And you see that people that have just been deeply, deeply wounded by people going outside the bounds that God has planned for the home and marriage and sexuality. There was an illustration of, uh, think of the white cliffs of Dover. Think of the little green grass up on top of the white chalk. Think of children playing. And think of someone putting up a fence all the way around. Uh, and then the little children are let loose. Now the children, when they see the fence, will run and be scared and go the other way. No, they won't. When there's a fence, they can play as close as they want to the oceans. Fences are safety. Fences are good. Take down the fence, and after a couple of kids fall off the white cliff, the other ones will be basket cases, and you and I would be too. Those laws, those rules, those limits to which we're not to go excessively beyond are for our good and for our pleasure also. Safely, again, the marriage bed is undefiled. That has all sorts of good implications from a good God that wants us to have children and wants to enjoy our, our mates and and there's nothing wrong with that. He is the author of that and says this is very good. And he has set those boundaries so that we, like those little children, can enjoy our day. You know, we, we know the boundaries. We know what to do. And then inside of that, we have a wonderful time. That's great. Have you ever met with victims and families that have been absolutely destroyed by family sin? A lot of times, that world on a little child or a teenager is imploding and they don't know the way out, and it just hits teenagers so hard. The world rationalizes and glamorizes uh, this sin. You'll have some singing show, and they'll, they'll be presented as uh, real uh, role models for you, but walking outside God's path, especially in this body, soul, and spirit matter of sexuality, is not the key to glamor and excitement, but the doorway to misery. Now, you and I know that because we're old and we've seen it. And our grandparents knew that. And you tell about some wonderful deal or some wonderful person you met or the greatest girl in the world, and your grandmother said, I'd, I'd probably slow down on that. I just think I'd hold off a little bit. And we think, Grandma, get back in the kitchen, cook me a cake or something. Don't sit out. You, you don't know anything. Well, the difference is Grandma was young once, and you've not been old yet, so I think I'd listen if I could. Uh, read chapter 4 and verse 6 again, that no man go beyond and defraud uh, in any matter. Why? Because the Lord is the avenger of all such. Now, it's wise to follow God's plans. It's a pleasure to follow God's plans. You have a chance of having a good home, a good family, a good marriage that lasts, and that marriage will be marked by happiness at every level. Uh, but the other thing is, just to be honest, the judge of all the earth will judge rightly. And uh, without Christ, not only do you not know what to do, you are on God's target, not as an object of his, uh, his uh, grace, but an object of his wrath. Uh, that is the, uh, he is the avenger of all such. The apostle tells us, again, marriage bed undefiled, and then to go on, these are rough words, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. You say, uh-oh, I've had some problems with my past. Remember the Bible verse, but such were some of thee. You're not defined after you come to Christ by the primary sin that led you into the need for Christ. You're not an alcoholic Christian. You're not a fornicating Christian. You're not an adulterous Christian. Those sins are put behind God's back as far as the east is from the west, never to be brought up, and you're not to be defined like that. That's why they have churches with basically liberal churches that are trying to define themselves by the primary sin involved. That's not right. That's not fair to the poor people that go there. You're giving absolutely the wrong message. There is a present day judgment. Now that's me. One of my patients met a new girl and ended up with some medical problems, went to the ER, and I looked down at the bottom to make sure they gave him the right injection and the right pills and that the nuclear uh, scan was to come back and make sure it was positive and negative for 
herpes or gonorrhea or chlamydia. I mean, I worked my way through it. We did the right thing. Physically, he'll be fine. But this is just a present day judgment that again, fleshes out, be not deceived. God is not mocked whatsoever. Man soweth up shall he also reap. Uh, it describes what happens to those to indulge in immorality. And you know what? It goes a lot further than just physically. It goes up according to Romans chapter 1 when we wave our fist in the face of God and worship the creature. Our society is now worshiping the creature. Tree huggers used to be a joke. Now it's going to shut down our energy grid. It uh, absolutely is a giving up and giving over of them to absolute lawlessness and including, according to Romans 1, sexual sin actually being caused by them rejecting God. That's the sequence of it. Uh, it says here that Dr. Olford mentioned when God's restraining hand is taken off an individual or a nation, there is no alternative to degradation and destruction. Uh, worse, not only is there a present judgment in our ER or uh, your thoughts and your attitudes and your ideas, which if they're not squaring up with God's are going to lead to a bad outcome one way or the other. There is a future judgment. Uh, it's appointed unto men once to die and after this the judgment, it says in Hebrews. That's a serious judgment. That is, uh, like Mark said the other day, it is a uh, white, great white throne judgment if you're a lost person and it's your judgment seat of Christ, which you'd much rather be at, as a saved person, but it's not going to be a Sunday school picnic, even though you're saved, uh, to go before the eyes of God. It's going to be all right. It costs Christ a lot for it to be all right. But again, it's going to be very serious. And this is, this thinking and these clear biblical principles, aren't they different from when you went to school? There's a lot of people of different ages in here. I, I graduated in high school in 78. A lot of you graduated right after the Civil War, I believe, from what you've told me. But uh, and some of you are just, just you know, barely peeking out of the high school here. But uh, isn't it different than it used to be? And it's because, uh, in that sense, a nation can reject God. I said a nation can't be saved or anything like that. But if enough people define that nation as a group and they all reject God and his plan, those are going to be horrible and serious uh, adventures and, and, and judgments before God. Appointed unto man, once to die, after though the judgment. In that day, those who desecrate sex as part of a rejection of God's plan, uh, then they will have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone is the second death. Well, that's cheerful enough, but it's true. That is a very, very serious thing. Our nation has uh, jumped whole cloth into this, and we're reaping the disastrous benefits of it. Well, thankfully, there's something better. Uh, not only the desecration, that's negative, but the consecration of uh, our sex life. That is means if you follow God's plan, there is more than lack of judgment, there is a positive, great benefit. Uh, thank God this is not the end of the story. So look again in 1 Thessalonians 4 and look in verse 3. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. So there's a method and a way with strength and power that we can be kept from this. And the way to do that, they mention two points here. Number one, your sanctification. That is being sanctos, uh, hagios means set apart, a holiness is what we, the word we would use uh, for God. You have to ask God to set you apart. You say, well, I'm not always faithful in that. I didn't say you were. Nobody thought you were. Uh, if, you, if, God, if you ask God to do that and say, if I am able to walk uh, in this manner, away and apart from the world, you'll get 100% of the credit, God, because everybody knows I couldn't do this. And you say, that's not me. It is. It's absolutely every one of us. That you should abstain one of the principal ways of violating the, God's plan for you to walk before him in holiness and sanctification is fornication. So you should say, and guard me and protect me and put a boundary around me and set off alarms when I get too close to those trip wires. And I'll need to have that so that I will not commit fornication. Again, fornication, umbrella sin, uh, adultery, uh, fornication, you know, sodomy, all sorts of sins that are aberrant are put under that umbrella. So this includes all of them. Uh, look in verse 4, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel, that is to 
present your body in this community, in this life, in this world, 3D, audiovisual, walking, talking representation of what God wanted for us. Am I like that? I'm not there yet. Are you like that? Probably better than me. That's the plan. That's the plan, that you should possess your vessel in sanctification honor so that you can be a living epistle known and read of all men, that the things that you preach and teach and give out tracts about and things like that are actually fleshed out in the people in our, in our little church, which is it should be. There's the positive. Not in the lust of concupiscence. That is, the lust is a strong desire. It's usually bad in the Bible, but not always. It can, that word can be used for a great desire for something good, but in this case it's bad, which the Gentiles know not God. We don't want to have the same sort of thoughts and input and uh, things that are beaming into our home and streaming into our home uh, that the Gentiles have which know not God. For example, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any means. Uh, look in verse 7. For God hath not called us to uncleanness but unto holiness. So this, as a diagnostic situation, ends up with us being bad. We are uh, not holy people. We want to be because we know and love God. But we have to turn. If, he's, if, if God hath not called us unto uncleanness, the implication is that we or others can call us unto uncleanness and that we would be making a terrible mistake and we would be looking the wrong way. God, according to Dr. Olford here, God never calls people to a life of sanctification and holiness without giving the enabling grace to achieve that end. There are two parts of this. Number one, you have to decide. And you say, yes, we know about that. We're, we're Christians that believe in people making decisions. Well, that's good because everything we do, just frankly, we have to decide. I like the sovereignty of God. I completely believe in it. But even the most hyper-Calvinist, it says, pass the salt. And unless you say pass the salt, the salt's not coming to you, whether it's God's will or not. I don't know what's going to do this or not, but it's not coming to you. But when you say pass the salt, that's not the end of it. The person that's down by the salt has to have the power and the hearing and all to carry that out. You have to and I have to come to the point where we say, we don't want to live like this. We don't want to be this way. Change us, God. And he'll say, uh, okay, and they'll say, in your power, by the blood of your son, by the work of the Holy Spirit. And he says, oh, that kind of change. Okay, I'm going to be involved. Absolutely. Number one, willingness for purity in the sex life. If you say we are willing, we do not want to be like the world. We don't want to be destroyed. We don't want to ruin our family. That's the idea. Dr. Olford says it's clear that God's will for every one of us is that we should know holiness in every area of our life, particularly in the married life. Therefore, here, to be willing to conform to God's will means a clean cut away from our past life and God asking him to develop in us and manifest in us a new life. All of this, this last one on the sexuality, the other ones that we've had before, all of these are the fleshing out of how God produces new creatures in Christ. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17, it's, it says, If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. This is how they are. This is the change. Jesus said this is serious. He said, If you're not willing to make this choice and to try to turn and then to ask me to help you to turn, you, you, it'd be better for you to pluck out your eye or cut off your hand than to be following this path to hell. So number one, you need to have the desire to decide and to tell God and say, help me turn. I choose to turn. But number two, you need to say, I've chosen to turn, but I can't do it. Holy Spirit, fill me, direct me, control me. Remember all those pictures, wind on the waves and the ships and the boats and everything. That's the idea. So it, it is a decision, and it is also a process that God takes over. Um, Again, Adrian Rogers has the best illustration. That I can, and we're going to do Jer David Jeremiah next week, so I can't be accused of only using <laughs> Adrian Rogers. But Adrian Rogers' uh, illustration about the spirit-filled life is you, say you're 110 pounds, and you, my left leg's 110 pounds, but let's say that yours is 110 pounds, and you, you want to drive an 18-wheeler down the highway. When I was in 
high school and in school, the school buses did not have power steering. They had these huge wheels that they turned, like Ralph Cramden on the Honeymooners. You know, he turned that big wheel. Well, anyway, you can't do it. Some of those things, you would need power steering or you would not be able to do that. He said the Holy Spirit is like the power steering. The power steering does no good until you decide to turn the wheel. But then when you turn the wheel, the power steering takes over and it does that which you, despite your decision, are not able to do. So you have to make a decision and then immediately confess you can't keep that uh, decision and ask God to help you and live you and fill you with his Holy Spirit. You still have to make a decision. But the, and, and he said the bus would not turn unless you made a decision, but it cannot turn unless the power steering kicked in. So you've got, the, you've got an action and a decision followed by a process. That's the idea. Are you ready and willing for a pluck out the eye and a cut off your hand? Uh, that sounds pretty serious. I don't want that. But you're in the spiritual life, your answer to this question determines whether or not you'll know uh, victory and sanctity in this area. Here's the problem, according to Dr. Olford. He's been in heaven many years now. He died in 2004. The supreme problem is unwillingness on the part of boys and girls and men and women to be a clean cut, that is, through with this and living for this, uh, in this matter of lust, illicit desire, and immorality. Your decision will not make you clean because you don't have that ability. If you get God involved, he has the power to make you clean. But it begins with that decision. You have to. Uh, if you're not willing to make that decision, you are not willing, he says, to live and, and even have the hope of living a pure life or victory. Uh, it is determination, not desire, that controls our destiny. And again, human determination is still not enough. It will be spirit-directed and fueled determination. Unless a man comes clear in his own mind and says, now, Lord, this is, this is just wrong. You know, you wake up in the pig pen sort of thing. Uh, now, Lord, I'm going to live a pure life and not have anything to do with immorality. If you, got, if you don't get that going, you haven't taken the first step. You're, you're a million miles away. We're all a million miles away. The Bible says, let not sin reign in your mortal body. Somebody's in charge of you. Uh, most people are in charge of themselves. They're going to just take over. And you know what? When you're young and smart and you ask people questions, man, they, they've got everything thought out, they think. Sin, though, for the Christian, must be dethroned. You need to be taken off the throne. The world needs to be taken off the throne. The television needs to be taken off the throne. I'm not against television. I'm against bad television and bad theology that gets in it. Sin must be dethroned and God enthroned if we are to know anything of victory and control in our sex life. If you want to learn, Dr. Olford's key message for his life, I would say, was victory. He talked about that all the time, about victorious Christian living. And it's very, very good. Look again in verse 4, that every one of you know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Those are strong words, and they don't apply only to our body. They apply to our spirit and our soul, our neighborhood, our church, our friends, our families, and not just us and our spouse. Your body and sex life can be preserved in holiness and honor by yielding totally to the Spirit of God, and he becomes the master. Look in verse 7. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. Uh, he therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man, but God who hath also given us his Holy Spirit. Uh, the natural attitude, here's another quote, of anyone informed of the secret of mastery, which is to transfer it to God, is to doubt or despise this message of deliverance. But Paul says to do that is to reject God altogether, who has given us the Holy Spirit to bring under control all of our desires. And again, I don't know how many times I've said it because I need to hear it. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20 talks about our relationship today, our body, and the Holy Spirit. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which is of God. You're not your own. You're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God with your body and spirit, which are God's. That is dripping with very practical things that are going to help me get past Weigel's without uh, my mind wandering or something. I mean, it, you, this is, you've got to have God's power on this. Coming down to the end here, we've yielded our soul and our spirit, but here's the body, and again, sexuality is not 
only or even primarily the, the body, it, but it's part of it. It's, it's, not, it's not just spirit and soul. We've yielded our soul and our spirit, but what of this truth, what of our body and this new realm we've discussed? He makes this point. A yielded spirit makes a spiritual Christian. A yielded mind, we talked about Francis Schaeffer and all the great heroes of the faith, makes an intelligent Christian. A yielded heart makes a loving Christian. A yielded will makes a forceful Christian. A yielded body makes a useful Christian and a yielded approach to your sexuality makes a dynamic Christian. Even after the time of having children or something is through, he's saying that that's the part of us that's still creative and still invested in the children that we had or, or things like that. He said, uh, then and only then can the purity and the mastery of which we are speaking be enjoyed by the Christian. Only he that is, H, capital H, God, can truly separate from sin and redirect to service the powers and passions in a man or woman's life. So, are you ready? To have purity, we have to uh, repent of our past wickedness, which is great, and say, you know, I'm still fighting with this. We've still got to have help. Will you help us? I choose not to walk. I'm willing to be made willing not to follow this path. You think, that's all you have to do? No. See, that's still you getting kind of lined up for God to do something and say, God, you're the, you are the life changer. You are the heart uh, transplanter. You are the one, and you, you alone are going to be able to change me, help me walk with you and face to face with you. And that's going to downstream do more than our decisions. But you do have to make a decision. You do have to turn away. Uh, there is purity and mastery in this area available for you. Wait for it in Christ. That's exactly who has that power and the power of the indwelling spirit. In this age of 9,000 channels and 400 of them good and the rest of them wacky, uh, we can still know victory because God, because they knew it in the days of Alexander. They knew it in the days of Corinth. They knew it in the days of Thessalonica with temple prostitutes and things like that. They knew it in the Great Awakening, first and second, in England and then in America. We think that the movie industry is horrible. They're ruining every series we've ever started to watch. Oh, it just is infuriating. The only good movies you've got, maybe two or three color movies, but you need to, Mitzi will tell you, you need to live in black and white world. It's a better world. Anything back in the 40s or 50s, they weren't Christians, but they lived in a world that operated in a Christian mindset. It was wonderful. That's the idea. Uh, and also, oh, about the Great Awakening, the stage was filthier than it is now, the, which that was the equivalent of movies back then. The, the, the actions of people, and, and uh, you can read Arnold Dalimore's book about the life of George Whitfield. He talked about the conditions in England uh, before Whitfield and Wesley got there. They were going downhill very fast. So the conclusion is consecration or desecration. Both of them a subject of our warnings of our lesson today and two or three points about each, but you have to choose. Choose you this day whom you will serve. You must decide. No one else can or will decide. Last paragraph. Are you willing to yield that delicate mechanism that we call human sexuality over to the indwelling Holy Spirit as well as the rest of your life, your body, your soul, and your spirit. But quite specifically, uh, to control and to master you, will you let him do it now? We are equipped and are in good position for this. I read, an, I read another series. This is a really comp I told Mark this is a complicated lesson today. You made me work so hard this week. I, most of them I remember from doing them before. I did not remember this one. But I read an Adrian Rogers message on about the same thing here, and he had four points on this, and it was exactly what benefits we've received that would give us the ability to win this battle. Number one, you have to, Adrian said, receive a gracious provision that is salvation. New life comes into your life. Christ comes into your life. Uh, yes, we're threatened by the little skid boats with uh, machine guns over there in the Red Sea. Oh! The USS Missouri just entered the Red Sea, and the Gerald Ford turned around and decided to come back early and join the Eisenhower. I wish they would do something, but that's, this is the idea here. You receive a gracious provision, salvation. You realize a grand purpose, victory. You're not praying to puff yourself up. You're praying to quit failing God, and we, we know how we fail God. 
not only a gracious provision, salvation, and a grand purpose, victory, you respect a grievous problem, the flesh. The problem is, why are we having these battles after we were saved? Look in Romans 7, we're still here. The, the body, the flesh, you know, oh, wicked man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of flesh? Now, that's the idea. Uh, and finally, not only you should respect a grievous problem, the flesh, you should remember a glorious principle, you can walk in the spirit. And when though that sets the triggers on where you're uh, getting out of bounds, the alarm will go off when you need power and you need a verse and you need a word from God, it's already there and you can walk in the spirit. So this is a topic that all the great preachers were, were on. You must decide and by itself, that's not enough. You must decide to not be the one to try to do this, that God will do it through you. That's the idea. Lord, thank you today for this message and through our series on this. Thank you for Dr. Olford and his ministry and help us to learn about stewardship as the year unfolds. Amen.